Hello everyone and welcome back to Nuclear Reactor Theory Lectures. Today we're going to discuss the Boltzmann Transport Equation, which is in many ways the main antagonist of nuclear engineering. Much of nuclear engineering involves solving the Boltzmann Transport Equation to determine the distribution of neutrons in a system. Before we discuss the Boltzmann Transport Equation, it's worth saying some words about Ludwig Boltzmann himself. Urban legend claims that, after discovering the Boltzmann Transport Equation, that Ludwig Boltzmann killed himself because he could not solve the equation. Yes, the equation is very difficult to solve, but in truth, Boltzmann suffered from depression and from what would probably be diagnosed today as bipolar disorder. Boltzmann theories about matter and statistical mechanics differed from the popular opinion in the scientific community at the time, which left Boltzmann defending his theories from the scientific community and, in turn, battling with depression. Boltzmann theories were ultimately vindicated, and still he was an extremely successful physicist in his day. Boltzmann's first lecture at the University of Vienna was held in the university's largest lecture hall, but it was so well attended that some students were watching it while standing in the stairwells. Despite this success, Boltzmann's oppression caused him to commit suicide by hanging himself in 1906. Boltzmann's transport equation will teach us many things in this course, but Boltzmann's death should also be a lesson to all of us. Anyone can suffer from depression, even people whose lives are extremely successful, and it's okay for us to seek help if we think we might be depressed. Seriously, folks, don't be afraid to talk to a counselor if you think you need some therapy, or even if you think you might need it. Now, before we discuss the Boltzmann transport equation, it's worth defining some terms. The angular neutron density, n, describes the expected number of neutrons within some dr of position r, with some energy dE within e, and some direction d omega within omega at time t. The angular neutron flux, psi, is the expected flux of neutrons within some dr of position r, with some energy dE within e, and some direction d omega within omega at time t. Just like the scalar fluxes that we've discussed before, we can convert from the neutron density to the neutron flux by multiplying n by the velocity of the neutrons, which is again just some function of energy. We can also define an angular current density, little j, by weighting the angular dependent angular neutron flux by the direction omega. We might want to do this because then the dot product of j and some differential area dA is equal to the net rate at which neutrons pass through the surface dA. It's worth noting that we'll later integrate the current density over different ranges of solid angles. And when we do this, it's generally convenient to define omega using this convention and this combination of theta and phi. We could always use some alternative omega convention, such as the one that we discussed a little bit earlier in this course, but this convention usually yields the most convenient balance for integration especially when we're computing the current in the x direction. We'll discuss this a little more later. Speaking of integrating over omega, we can integrate each of these three quantities over omega. Integrating little n over omega gives us the scalar, or total, neutron density. Integrating psi over omega gives us the scalar neutron flux, phi. And integrating little j over omega gives us the neutron current density, j. It's often useful to compute partial current densities, which describe the net rate at which neutrons flow in some direction or leak across some surface with a surface normal vector E sub s. We can find the positive and negative partial currents, j plus and j minus, by integrating little j over the plus or minus 2 pi half spheres, where positive 2 pi is the half of the unit sphere that falls in the positive x direction, and negative 2 pi is the half of the unit sphere that falls in the negative x direction. Given our definition of omega, for positive 2 pi, the phi bounds range from 0 to 2 pi, and the theta bounds range from 0 to pi over 2. For the negative half sphere and the negative 2 pi, phi ranges from 0 to 2 pi again, and theta ranges from pi to pi over 2. With this definition, the net current is equal to j plus minus j minus, which implies that the net current equals zero for an isotropic flux. In other words, if neutrons are traveling in all directions with an equal probability. This makes sense. If neutrons are traveling equally in all directions, 
then there is no overall net flow or net current of neutrons. On average, neutrons are not traveling preferentially in any one direction. Let's work a quick example by computing J plus across some surface facing the positive x direction given an isotropic flux. Because its flux is equally probable in all directions, an isotropic flux is not a function of theta, which means that the angular current density is equal to omega times this omega independent function, f. We'll define f for real later on, but for now let's just say that it's this ambiguous function. Because our surface faces the positive x direction, the E sub s vector equals 1, 0, 0, which means that E s dot omega simply equals the cosine of theta. From here we can carry out the integration, and soon we find that the positive net current equals the function f times pi. Now, the time has come for us to derive the Boltzmann transport equation. The transport equation effectively describes the balance of neutrons in some system, where the time rate of change of the neutron population in some differential element of phase space, in other words, its r, e, and omega coordinates, is equal to the sum of the sources of neutron gains minus the sources of neutron losses. Ultimately, we'll want to solve this equation in terms of the flux, phi, or psi, so we'll rewrite this equation by dividing phi, or psi, by the neutron velocity. In general, we'll move the neutron loss term to the other side of this equation, which means that the neutron population's rate of change plus the neutron losses equals the neutron gains. In general, there are six neutron balance terms for us to consider. First, there is the time rate of change, which we've already discussed, and then there are the neutron leakage and absorption terms, and on the gain side of the equation, we find the sources of neutrons through scattering reactions, through fission reactions, and through independent neutron sources. In general, we'll include the scattering source on the left-hand side of this equation with the other loss terms. We'll discuss exactly why the scattering term is transplanted a little later, but in short we do this because it makes the algorithms for solving the Boltzmann transport equation more simple. Now, let's discuss these terms in more detail and let's define them. We've already discussed the neutron rate of change term, which equals 1 divided by the velocity times the time rate of change of the angular flux. The next term, the leakage term, is perhaps the strangest and most unintuitive of these six terms. Mathematically, the neutron leakage depends on the net current that flows out of some area, some dA, that encloses a volume. But in general, we prefer not to do surface integrals. So what we'll do is use Gauss's law to convert this angular current integral into omega dot the gradient of psi. In Cartesian coordinates, this omega dot del operator equals omega x times the partial derivative with respect to x of the function on which we're operating, plus omega y times the partial derivative with respect to y of the function, etc. This operator is different in spherical or cylindrical coordinates, which is something that we'll discuss and see later on. The absorption, or collisional term, reflects that every collision will potentially remove a neutron from whatever phase space it's in. Even if the collision doesn't absorb the neutron, a scatter can change the neutron's energy or direction, which moves it into a different region of phase space than it possessed originally. The scattering source tallies the rate at which neutrons from all other energies E prime, and all other directions, omega prime, scatter into this phase space, which again has energy E and direction omega. It's worth noting that neutrons can scatter into exactly the same energy and exactly the same direction that they had before entering a collision. When this happens, the scattering source and the absorption term will cancel out. The fission source describes the source of neutrons emitted from fission reactions in the system. The innermost terms of this integral, which integrate over another E prime and omega prime, are used to determine the number of fission reactions and then the number of fission neutrons emitted in our dr region. Multiplying this fission neutron production rate by chi of E over 4 pi yields the expected number of fission neutrons that are born with energy E and with direction omega. This chi over 4 pi term is really just the probability that fission neutrons will have some energy E and direction omega when they are emitted, 
This makes sense since chi of E is the probability distribution for the emission energy of fission neutrons, and 1 over 4 pi is the probability distribution that an isotropic fission reaction will emit neutrons in some direction. We'll discuss this more when we discuss kinetics, but it's worth noting that our new value in this equation is actually new for prompt neutron emission only. In reality, some fission neutrons are emitted with a delay due to the decay of neutron-rich fission products. This delayed form of fission neutron emission is discussed in detail when we discuss nuclear reactor kinetics. Lastly, we may have a source of neutrons in our system that is completely independent of the system's neutron distribution and flux. An example of this could be a californium neutron source that's emitting neutrons by decay that's sitting inside of a reactor. Another source could be a beam of neutrons that is instant on some lump of fissile material. These independent neutron sources are all very situation dependent. The value of s depends on what exactly comprises these independent neutrons and their sources, and so thus we account for them in the Boltzmann transport equation by using this ambiguous s function. So with all six terms combined, we form Captain Planet. I mean, the Boltzmann transport equation. We can now track and solve for the distribution of neutrons in some system. We'll begin discussing exactly how to do this in the following lectures.